Welcome everyone to Anvil and Hammer, episode number six. Number six, Anvil and Hammer. I'm Sean Bradford, the founder of the Armory Bible board game, and I'm joined by my wife, Sarah Bradford. Hello. Hi. I'm the tester of the game and the spell checker. Yeah, there's no magic in the game, so you're not that kind of spell checker. <laughs> no. I tried very hard to kind of keep it away from spellcasters and putting a positive light on mm. the occult. So on the anvil and hammer, we seek to hammer out the truth of God's word. So today we have interviewed Dustin Seegers. He's a friend of Cy Tim Brudenkate, who we interviewed on the previous episode, and they've done work together. And that's sort of how I really got into contact with him was through following Cy's ministry and seeing what Cy gets up to. And he's here today to talk to us about a very important topic for Christians, which is logic. So we're going to be covering the 101 of logic. And you might be thinking, well, why is a podcast that's focused around a Bible board game for families talking about logic? The reason is that why we're talking about logic today is because the, the Armory Bible board game is designed to be customizable. So you can really get any field of study and adapt it to the armory. The attack challenges or the red card challenges by default are set with teaching the law of God and Bible doctrine. So key key doctrine to understand the gospel. It's imperative to know the law of God because it condemns man and shows us the need for the savior. So it's really important that that has its own category. The blue cards or the defense cards are focused around apologetics. So this is understanding key doctrine to why the Bible is true. Key doctrines on who Christ is and and things to really counter cults. So that's what that is focused on. And then utility is general wisdom, devotional understanding of the Bible, but also to understand the Bible uh, systematically as a whole. So understanding where Bible books are, maybe understanding what are the key themes or ideas of books. So that's all falls within the utility. Now you can customize that however you want. If I was adapting what we're about to learn today into the Armory board game, I would fit it into the blue card section, which is the apologetics section. So an example of this would be someone picks up a card and they ask the game master for a defense question. And then you, having prepared something about logic from listening to this, could then adapt it, adapt a question for that person. So you could say, in your own words, Describe what a straw man fallacy is or give an example of a straw man fallacy. And that's just a way to teach the logic through this game and incorporate into the board game. That's the idea of why we're we're doing different topics on different things and hope to give you some ideas. I hope that clears some things up. Back to Dustin Seegers. He runs a podcast which you should check out called Bible and the Raw. That's R-A-W, Bible and the Raw. That's under the Bible Thumping Wingnut Network, which is the Bible Thumping Wingnut.com. Definitely check it out. They're really great short segments, about 10 minutes long on a topic. So it's great if you're driving to work or you're walking somewhere. A sort of punchy podcast, which I highly recommend that you go check out. Now, unfortunately, Sarah, you weren't able to join us on this particular interview, but you will be listening to it and then commenting on it as well. Yeah, I will be. I suppose looking after a baby is a full-time job. Any mothers know that, so nap time rules the day so if it's nap time i have to go and look after my baby make sure my baby naps yep and that's how it goes sometimes so why don't we get this show on the road and hope you learn something and we'll see you in a while my name is dustin seekers and i am an evangelist that lives here in North Carolina, in the Greensboro area of North Carolina in the United States. And I've been doing street evangelism since about 1996, open air preaching, one-on-one evangelism, mostly on college campuses and outside of an abortion clinic since 1996. I came to faith in Christ in the mid-90s. I'm Calvinistic in my in my views of how God saves people. And I believe because of that, we will have, we will have success in evangelism. My apologetics, some people call it reasoned fideism. Some people call it dogmatic presuppositional. I just call it biblical apologetics. And I, I just take the scriptures, I apply them in their historical context, 
and try to make them relevant to the lives of both believers and unbelievers that I interact with. I do a little bit of pastoral work on the side. I have been a pastor. I've got over 10 years of pastoral experience and have been doing some type of ministry work since the mid-90s. And I really enjoy it. And I appreciate the opportunity to come on here and speak with you. And I hope you enjoy what we'll talk about today. I suppose maybe just introduce how you got into studying logic as well. I was forced into it. When you engage unbelievers with the gospel, I just wanted to share the gospel with people after I was saved. And as you begin to do that, you run into some pretty smart people and they'll ask you some tough questions. And you either got have to get answers to those questions and learn how to negotiate those types of conversations, or you're just going to stop doing evangelism because you're going to, nobody wants to look stupid, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a natural protective desire to kind of defend yourself in that way. And so I said, you know, I've got to get some answers to these things. And so I began to study systematic theology and began to study things like textual criticism. How do I, in the canonicity of the scripture, how do I know that the books that we have should have been in the New Testament, the Old Testament, etc.? I began to study church history and then philosophy and logic and deeper areas of apologetics, which is defending the Christian faith, the art and science of defending the Christian faith. And with that comes learning how to think critically. And critical thinking is the application of the laws of reasoning and the laws of thought to that thinking process, and that will get you into studying logic. And I try to read one book on logic a year hmm. or go back and reread some of the books that I've, that I've read before, and it, it really helps me more than th – three things have helped me more than anything else. The first thing is knowing systematic – as far as the intellectual life – Know your systematic theology. Know what your Bible teaches. Know your Bible and know it well. The great theological themes of the Bible. Know them well. The second thing that, that I think you need to know is you need to understand how to have a conversation with people that's winsome and attractive. You need mm -hmm. to be able to negotiate through a conversation with someone with charity, with respect. And then the third thing you need is you need to know how to critically think. You need to learn how to take the principles of, of reasoning, of logic, and apply those principles to a conversation in such a way that you can navigate through that conversation in an intellectually profitable way. So I don't know if you're familiar with some of the things that have been happening in Ireland as of recently with this vote for or against oh, yes. abortion. So Sarah and myself actually, well, we were based in Ireland for a long time. Sarah's actually Irish. I'm a, my background is a bit more complicated, but we went back to vote because right now we're based in the UK. And mm. one reason I, I want to talk about logic is because, well, at the moment I'm going through Kopi on logic and I'm going through Greg Bronson's critical thinking lecture series. Mm. And one thing I was, one thing I noticed with this whole debate was how logic just seems to go out the window. I had to remind myself that there's a spiritual element of this as well. So this is what I wanted to discuss with you. You're absolutely right. Uh, it, you were talking about Copy and Cohen working through that book and Bonson's material. I actually did that myself about 15 years ago when they had a seminary. I got the seminary notes at the time, had already done a seminary degree, so I didn't feel like I needed to do another degree. I did. I worked through that whole class. That's an excellent book. Mm, excellent right. book. I work with children and youth, so I wanted to try and teach some of these principles along with the Bible to them. Right. Right. You know, there's a really good book that Dr. Jason Lyle produced. You probably are already aware of it. It's called Discerning Truth, where he actually goes through and uses each one of the major logical fallacies that you'll run into when you're talking to unbelievers and even other Christians. And he works through each one of those and gives examples of those. And, and I actually used that book to work through with some students that I was teaching in a homeschool co-op here where I live, and it was great. I'm familiar with uh, Lyle's book, The Ultimate Proof of Creation. I've certainly gone through that, and that's a very good read. And I'd recommend that to anyone mm -hmm. listening. So I, I just want to quickly talk about the nature of the mind. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, because this is really important to keep in mind when you start studying how to reason. So it says, these things we also speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So we're dealing, obviously, with a spiritual issue. So 
one way I try to explain it to people is that if you can demonstrate through reason, through logic, that smoking is bad for someone's health, I won't necessarily persuade them to stop smoking. There are other factors going into why people behave the way they do. So that's important to keep in mind because I think one of the one thing where you could be discouraged about if you start learning logic is you might think, oh, well, everyone's going to be changing their mind. But we read from scripture that this <laughs> isn't necessarily the case. That's right. Yeah, I, it's, it's funny you mention this. I was just uh, reasoning, well, attempting to reason with a clinic escort this morning when they stand outside of the uh, local abortion clinic. For those that aren't that, that don't know me, I, I, I do quite a bit of evangelism. And most of my evangelism at this point in my life is outside of an abortion clinic because of the, the work schedule that I have. I just am not able to get out to the university as much as I like to. That's actually my favorite group of people to talk to about Jesus is our, our university college students. Once I'm talking to this lady, I can just see her getting angry and I'm saying, look, I understand why you're getting angry. And I, and I begin to use some of these, some of this information and they just don't care. And the reason they don't care is because as you read, the natural man, the natural person does not embrace, accept, or welcome. The word there in the Greek is dekomai, and it means to accept so as to welcome as, as truth for one's own. In other words, truth that is embraced as as truth for oneself. And the natural person, the unregenerate person, does not have the spiritual capability to do that because they they have the effects of sin on the mind are such that it causes them to be opposed to God and God's truth in thought, word, and deed. And one of the verses that you read there is certainly one of the verses that I use as a proof text, as it were, to demonstrate that. And that's what theologians have called the noetic effects of sin. The noetic, it just comes from the Greek word nous, which means mind. And it's just the effects of sin on the mind. And the effects of sin on the mind just cloud people to a point where either they see what you're saying, but they internally oppose it and they will not embrace, accept it, etc. Or their mind is truly clouded to the truth and they are inwardly confused by both just the works of their own flesh confusing them and them having a confused mind psychologically. And then, of course, demonic activity, 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 and 25 says that they are held captive by the devil in his snare to do his will. And that doesn't mean that they themselves are directly held captive by Satan, but demonic activity is taking place either directly or indirectly. And most of the time in the West, it happens indirectly through false philosophies I can't think of strategically from a demonic standpoint, I can't think of a better way to deceive people in the West, which is a rationalistic society, than to use seeming rational philosophy and rational argumentation within their worldview to try to get them to think all this nonsense. And I'm thankful that Paul addressed the mind and the effects of sin on the mind as much as he did in the New Testament, and that God providentially put him in such a huge mixture of different environments, such as, you know, the Romans were pragmatists. You know, let's just get this thing done. And so Paul addressed that. And then, of course, the Greeks were, that's where most of, much of unbelieving Western thought and civilization, the abortion mindset, the death culture and all that, that's where all that comes from is Greek mm -hmm. philosophy and the extensions of it. And then once you come to the end of, of Western philosophy, Greek philosophy, which is, what is it? It's postmodernism. There's no truth, no certainty, and no absolutes. Mm -hmm. That's what you're left with. And when you have an individual that embraces elements of postmodernism, they don't have to brace it whole hog, but all they have to do is embrace the elements of it. It's it just enough to make them comfortable. And that's really what this is all about. People want to be sinfully comfortable. Mm. They don't want to be made inconvenient. They want to get rid of people and kill people because they cost too much. Well, from the standpoint of moral law, we don't get to kill people because they're too expensive. We don't get to kill people because they're inconvenient to us. But if we can custom craft and you have enough unbelievers can custom craft laws according to a democratic political process that will allow them to stay comfortable and use abor abortion as birth control, then that's exactly what they're going to do. And that's what you've seen happen in Ireland. You've, you've seen the loss of the effects of the gospel and you have a, a truly unregenerate population of people for the most part. And as a result of that, you're going to end up with laws that reflect wherever the people are. If the people think yeah, it's okay so. to have, you know, practice pedophilia, then you're going to see laws that okay pedophilia. If people think it's okay to enslave or 
kill a particular section of the human population because that particular section of the population is deemed to be a socioeconomic burden or some kind of moral burden or whatever reason. It's happened here in the United States. It's happened in Nazi Germany. And their Aryan mythicism led them to the point where they really could go and gas Jews to death by the hundreds a day in some cases and then burn them in in ovens and then go home and hug and kiss their children and have dinner together and all that. Well, how is that possible? Well, it's because of the noetic effects of sin on the mind. It's the effects of sin on the unregenerate mind, which will allow the unbeliever to try to justify in their mind anything that makes sense to them because of their twisted and perverse thoughts. Proverbs 26 verse 3 says that it says, A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. Right. And... Because we're dealing with something that is spiritual, something that has to do with the heart, and Je Jesus explains this in Mark chapter 7, that from the heart comes foolishness, and from the heart comes evil thoughts and adulteries, and this is what defiles a man. But he lists foolishness within that list. And I think it's important to understand that you're dealing with a spiritual issue, and logic or knowledge isn't necessarily what someone needs in that case. They need to be, in a sense, rebuked, or they need the Word of God proclaimed, and in a sense, the judgment of God proclaimed. Would you agree with with that? I, I agree 100%, and I can't think of a better place that that needs to happen than outside of an abortion clinic. We've had several people who have come out before with us, and they have said that you guys just come across a little harsh. And I tell them, I say, look, the clinic workers— those that are wearing the scrubs that are going into the clinic, the escorts know what they're doing. Mm. They know what they're doing. They know that they're killing unborn human beings. For profit. For profit. It's blood money. And I said, so it's not like we're all out here wondering what each other's doing out here. I said, you are naive if you honestly think that these people are so deceived that they don't realize that babies, pre-born babies are dying inside of that clinic. It sometimes it turns into a rebuke for the person that brings this issue up. And I, again, I'm not trying to be ugly or mean or anything like that. That's not my point. But I can't think of a more vivid example to get passionate about and to be very direct and frank with people about and to rebuke people over than the issue of abortion. And this, this could be nothing more than just the wrath of God. And I, I really do believe that, brother. I, I believe that abortion is an outward evidence, as Romans 1 says. It's a manifestation of the wrath of God being poured out on a nation. And I think that once a country goes down this path, that is external proof that a large majority of the people inside that nation, because they have personally rejected God in their thoughts, they've gone after vain idols. In other words, they've gone after the idols of humanism and comfort. The, the people that are participating in that, should they not be granted repentance, will have a very, very heavy price to pay in eternity. Because God is good and he's fair. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so when I, when I stand outside the clinic, I preach that. But sometimes I will hold large, massive photographs of aborted babies. And I do that because I do want to shove in their face what they're doing. I want everybody to understand that I'm going to remind you from the Word of God and from God's reality what you are doing every single time you go out there. And people, people will look and, and say, you're being harsh. You shouldn't show that. And I said, look, if they're willing to do it, I'm willing to show it. I yeah. want you to be very aware of what's going on. And, and what I found is the evangelical church kind of has a hands-off approach for the most part to this. Very, very few pastors that I interact with, really, this is not a front burner issue for them. Yeah, which is very sad because if you can't love those whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? It is a, it is a pressing issue. It yeah. is. So with that being said, we've been, we've been talking about the noetic effects of sin and how this is a heart issue. What is the benefits then of studying logic? The benefits first and foremost are for you. Logic is typically defined as the principles that determine correct reasoning from incorrect reasoning. Some logicians define logic as, for instance, the relationship between propositions. A proposition is just a sentence that asserts something. If you take the basic laws of logic, such as, say, for instance, the law of identity, Sean Bradford has to be Sean Bradford. Sean Bradford cannot be Sean Bradford and not Sean Bradford, okay? It, your, your identity is equal to your person, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that then leads us into the law of non-contradiction, which is that Sean Bradford cannot be Sean Bradford 
and Dustin Seegers at the same time and in the same way or in the same sense. That's logically impossible. When you are engaging and reasoning through the scriptures, it's important for you to be able to take some of those basic principles and apply them consistently to the text when you're trying to understand what the text says. An example would be, we look at the verse that you quoted right out of the get-go from the start of this podcast, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for it's foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Well, if it says he that, that the natural man or the natural person does not receive, accept, or welcome the things of the Spirit of God, that does not is completely opposite from the natural man does accept the things of the Spirit of God. No, he doesn't. And so why is that important? You're like, well, that's obvious. Of course it's obvious. When you get into some types of theology where there are Christians, there are some well-meaning believers who will try to argue, no, the, the natural person, the unsaved person, the unregenerate person can accept, welcome, and embrace the things of the Spirit of God. Well, that text tells you that is that is impossible. That's contradictory. Hmm. So that is a godly application of the law of non-contradiction to exegesis. And we all understand that. I mean, we, I don't, my children don't have to understand that there's a difference between playing with a ball versus not playing with a ball. They, they intuitively understand that because they interact with God's reality and their minds are made in such a way, their physical brains are constructed by God in such a way that they're going to interact with reality and very quickly learn that there's a difference between touching the hot stove versus not touching the hot stove. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they don't understand that that's the law of non-contradiction. But they these things are, are more so caught than they are taught. And I think that's good because these are elements of reality that exist that you can use not only to better understand your faith and encourage you in your faith, but can also be used to help you think through unbelieving thought and then apply it to the unbeliever in a way that's edifying to the church as they can see this in action or can really help if God is drawing that unbeliever, can help them see the error of their ways. Hmm. Because our God is a sovereign God and he draws people to himself, but he does so through means. And you may be part of the means. So what we're really training ourselves to do is to be discerning, to find out what is the will of God and to think God's thoughts. God is rational. Come, let us reason together. Right. God thinks in a way that is consistent. He doesn't contradict himself. He doesn't lie. So by right. learning how to reason well, we're learning how to think like God, to be like God, to be his children, and to glorify him. So it's part of our worship. Would you agree with with that? Yes, absolutely. We're commanded by God. The The essence of all law is found in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, where Jesus answered and says to that scribe, those Jewish teachers of the law, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's your, that's, those are your uh, affections, your emotions, your soul, your mind, and your strength. On, two, on those two commands, and love your neighbors yourself, on those two commands hang or depend all the law and the prophets. If you want to understand the moral teaching of the Old Testament, it can be summed up in those two great laws. That is the moral, the, the, the trans-covenantal moral law. It's love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbors yourself. And that includes your mind. Those, that's your rational faculties. And so God wants us to love. We are commanded to be rational. We're commanded to be clear thinkers in Scripture. That is part of the first great commandment. So what would you say then, we've looked a bit at the benefits of studying logic, but what, what now is the purpose of reasoning with others? What is the purpose of apologetics? Yeah, the purpose of apologetics is, is ultimately we are defending the faith once for all handed down to the saints. Okay, we're earnestly contending for the faith. So that involves those who, if we're, I just quoted from Jude 3, that involves in dealing with those who, as Jude says, have crept in unawares. So we have heretics that enter the church, creep in unawares. They, are, they enter into our love feasts or they take part in our communion services where we are remembering the broken body and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. They creep in there. They're false teachers and false believers that have entered the church and are teaching heresy, and these people abound. I mean, the, they are actually the church's greatest problem. It's not atheism. It's battles from the inside, whether it's dealing with what I call charismania, you know, like with Todd White, where he's trying to lengthen people's legs, and he calls that sharing the gospel. That's not sharing the gospel. 
Hmm. That's just sleight of hand. You're you're lying to people. So you would need logic to help you think through that and a clear understanding of Scripture and what Scripture teaches about healing and all of those types of things. And then the second thing is that we are going to have to deal with attacks on the Bible that come from within the church and try to discern, are the things that these people saying, are they things that are consistent with what's not only revealed in Scripture itself, but does the evidence used to support Scripture and the transmission of the text, such as textual criticism, are those things legitimate? For instance, we have uh, someone like, I think of Peter Enns. Peter Enns in, here in America uh, makes a lot of really truthful statements about Scripture, but then he takes that and goes well beyond what is accepted within evangelical circles, and he basically is a liberal in sheep's, a theological liberal in sheep's clothing and tries to pawn himself off that way. And he tends to appeal to people who are of the upper crust or probably middle class, upper upper middle class or higher that have a real interest in the Bible, but are seeing problems in Scripture, such as when God commanded Joshua's armies to go and slay the Canaanites. Peter Inns, Kenton Sparks, these are guys that, that I've interacted with myself, and they themselves say, look, there's no way that the real God of the Bible, ever, the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's no way that he, he himself could have commanded that. Those words were put into Yahweh's mouth in the Old Testament by whoever put Joshua together. So we need logic to think through those things. That, that, mm-hmm. Those are textual critical and higher critical issues that are taking place within the church within the so-called professing Christian church. And we need to be able to think through those things and look and evaluate those arguments and say, does this really hold? Critical thinking is just the application of good, sound, logical laws to thinking. My purpose is when I teach logic is I try to get people to understand there's about four or five common logical fallacies that you'll see. The first one is a straw man. A straw man is when you attack a caricature of what someone believes instead of what they actually believe. The most effective way to interact with people, is to, whether believer or unbeliever, is to use respectful, clear, and cogent communication. What I mean by cogent is thinking that is coherent and rational and biblical. If you use incoherent and irrational thinking, then your message is going to be received that way too. Now, if you're trying to talk to, say, for instance, getting back to the issue of abortion, you're trying to talk to a pro-choice person or pro-death person, they're already irrational. I've never met Mm -hmm. one pro-choice person, one pro-choice supporter that was ever able to give me any kind of respectful, clear, and cogent communication, ever. Mm -hmm. They may try to start out that way. Then when you begin to call them on their logical fallacies, they will begin to straw man you. In other words, they will begin to attack a caricature of what you believe instead of what you actually believe and instead of what the Bible actually believes or what your position actually is. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they are beyond correction usually. They rarely will stop and say, okay, you made a good point there. Thank you for the correction. I misunderstood your position. They rarely will do that. And a lot of Christians won't do that either Mm -hmm. when they're being attacked by an atheist. When they misrepresent an atheist position, and they respond back, well, they just continue to impute to that atheist what they think the atheist believes. And that may not be what they believe. Atheism is has many denominations. There's atheistic nihilism, which denies that there's any transcendent meaning or purpose, and therefore there can be no transcendent objective moral values or duties. Well, there are other atheists like Sam Harris who deny that. They say, no, there do exist objective moral values and duties. You're going to have to deal with those different atheists in different ways, and you can't attack what you think they believe because... You have to engage in effective, rational discussion with that person. You have to determine that, and that takes conversation. Yes. The next logical fallacy is you attack a person's character or background instead of their actual argument or position. And that happens a lot. For instance, I went to a fundamentalist seminary that was unaccredited, and and I did that on purpose, by the way. I didn't have the money to attend a accredited school here in the United States. It would have cost me about twenty five, thirty thousand dollars at the time. And I just I wasn't I'd already had two college degrees and was already in debt. So I said, look, can I what do the reviews show? Do the reviews of this school show that I can get a quality education for much less you know, for an affordable price? I'm never going to teach in a seminary or a Bible college, so it's not necessary for me per se to have an accredited degree. I've had people bring that up, you know, that you went to an accredit an unaccredited seminary And I just respond and say, look, that is attacking my background instead of what I'm saying. It may be true that my seminary was horrible, but I want to know how do you interact with what I'm actually saying? 
Yeah. Those are two very common logical fallacies. A straw man attacking a caricature, caricature of what someone believes instead of what they actually believe. An ad hominem attacking a person's character or background instead of their actual argument or position. And I think the way you've described that is very important because I think when studying logic, you all these fallacies have Latin names and it's easy to throw out the Latin and just bombard people. But right. to explain it like, as you said, well, actually you're, you're attacking my character. You're attacking the origin of you know, where I've done my study and it's not really relevant to this conversation. Saying it like that, I think, is appropriate because it helps people understand why their reasoning is erroneous. But if right. you have to say, oh, that's an ad hominem, you know, they, they probably don't know what that means, and you just sort of come across as a jerk. So you want to be careful of that. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. A third common fallacy that you see is the red herring fallacy. And this is when it typically happens when you're interacting with someone, and they know that they have been caught on the horns of a dilemma, You've shown that their thinking is not good here. You've shown that their thinking is very confused on a particular issue. And what do they do? Well, they start to bring up irrelevant issues to distract from the main argument. Because they know that they don't have an argument anymore. They sense that they've intellectually lost some ground there. And so they begin to bring up irrelevant issues to distract from the main argument. This happens a lot when I'm talking to cultists or atheists. This happens a lot when I'm talking to cultists or atheists. I've noticed it a lot with Jehovah's Witnesses when I'm speaking with them, and I bring up the issue of how their organization predicted the end of the world five times and got it wrong five times. I show it to them in their literature, and they blow it off and say, well, I know about this or whatever. And but the real issue is we want to teach people how they can be right with Jehovah and know how they can have a place in his kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. I said, look, that doesn't answer the false prophet issue. Hmm. I said, you're getting away to some ultimately irrelevant issue. I said, I agree that the issue of being a part of God's kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth is very important. But how can you trust what the watchtower is telling you on that issue when the mothership has got its predictions about the end of the world wrong five times? I mean, if the mothership who produced the ideas about what you believe about Jesus, that he's not God— He's not God in the flesh. There is no Trinity, and that salvation is a mixture of faith plus works. Then how do you know that anything else that they teach you is right? If they got the end of the world wrong five times, <laughs> many false prophets have come to the world. First John four one. We don't listen to them. Obviously, Deuteronomy thirteen, Deuteronomy eighteen says that if a prophet comes and presumes to speak in the name of Yahweh, and they get that prophecy wrong, or they speak in the name of Yahweh and the prophecy comes right, but they lead you after other gods, then you don't give heed to that prophet. Mm -hmm. So you're using the law of non-contradiction there and showing, look, these people have predicted the end of the world five times. That contradicts reality, and so what they'll do at that point, they realize that they've been had. And so they'll bring up an irrelevant issue to try to save face. That's called a red herring. What would be the difference between a red herring, a non sequitur, and irrelevant thesis? Are those all very similar things? They're all very similar. The fallacy of irrelevant thesis is a form of a red herring. So okay. uh, an example that Dr. Lyle brings up in his book, Discerning Truth, is that let's say that you are investigating a plane crash and you're on the scene, you're a journalist and you're on the scene you see the smoke rising up over your shoulder in the distance and this person walks up, clothes are all tattered. They start to tell you about the plane crash and you ask them, well, how did you survive the plane crash? And they say, well, I'm here, aren't I? Well, yeah, you're here and you're telling us about the plane crash, but I asked you, how did you survive the plane crash? And so that's the fallacy of relevant thesis. The fact that you're here doesn't tell me how you survived the crash. It just tells me that you're here. Hmm. Which we're not disputing either. <laughs> yeah, I'm not disputing that you're here. That's obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I'm questioning is how did you make it out of the thing? A red herring would be a distraction, and, and that's a form of red herring. The non sequitur is when the conclusion does not follow from what was previously said. Now, this happens a lot too. For instance, Christians do this a lot. Let me give you a caveat here. I have to say this before I bring up this example. I am not a theistic evolutionist or evolutionary creationist. I personally do not buy into neo-Darwinian theory. I don't think it is scientifically valid, and I also don't think that there's room for it in the scriptures. I don't think scripture ever addresses that. I don't think scripture has any room for that particular theory. I know that some people listening may hold to that, and I'm not picking on you if you do. 
But what some believers will do that hold to theistic evolution or evolutionary creationism, they will point to Charles Darwin and the work that he did. They will point to how he showed that there was all this variation in, say, finches or tortoises on the Galapagos Islands, and then use that to bolster the rationale for why they hold to biological evolution. Well, that doesn't follow. Hmm. Just because you see variation, you see a biological diversity and variation among all of these different types of creatures, that doesn't tell us that we all came from goo. So that's a non sequitur. Okay. So it would be something similar to a hasty generalization. Yeah, exactly. It's a hasty generalization. Okay. What that does is that tells you there's variation. And either biological evolution, whether it's theistic or naturalistic, as well as six-day young earth creationism, they both can account for why there's variation among organisms. It doesn't tell us whether either one's true. So it would be a non sequitur to say, well, because we see all this great variation in bacteria and baseball players and bananas and birds, that therefore proves that we all came from a rock. No, it doesn't. It could just as easily prove that we came from a common designer. Mm. It could just as easily prove that we came from aliens. It could prove (laughs) anything. It doesn't prove either position either way. So that would be an example of a non sequitur. The way that a lot of unbelievers use it, at least when I'm talking, say, for instance, to an atheist, most of which are naturalists, is they'll say all we've ever observed are non-miracles. We've never observed a miracle. Therefore, miracles don't happen. Well, that's another example of a hasty generalization and a non sequitur. It does not follow that because you've never seen a miracle that miracles don't happen. You've never seen me die before either. If you use the same argument and apply it to me, it means I'm never going to die. I've never seen the existence of the universe. I've never seen the universe come into existence. I guess the universe didn't come into existence. I've never seen your birthday. I guess you were never born. Obviously, those are absurd examples. But the reason why they're absurd, that's how you can show that a person's position is ridiculous, you can reduce your opponent's position to absurdity by showing that if you apply the same logic to other issues, it doesn't make a lick of sense. Mm -hmm. That's called reductio ad absurdum. Uh, You'll see it listed that way in the logic textbooks. But it's just reducing your opponent's position to absurdity by showing that if they hold that particular position, that it leads to absolutely absurd conclusions. One more that you see quite a bit, and then I'll talk about another one. Great. It's called a genetic fallacy, and the genetic fallacy is simply defined as attacking the origin of a belief rather than the truthfulness of the belief itself. It's attacking the origin of a belief rather than the truthfulness of the belief itself. So this, Dustin, this would be sort of a branch off of the ad hominem fallacy. Yes, it is a type of the ad hominem attack. It's attacking a person's character or their background instead of their actual argument or position. Here would be a great example of this of how this happens a lot in theological debate among believers, true believers. You may have an Arminian over here who denies eternal predestination and unconditional election because John Calvin consented to the burning of Miguel Cervantes Mm. uh, in Geneva in the 1500s. And many Arminians, many what I call street Arminians and and uneducated Arminians, and I'm not, again, I'm not picking on them, they're just uninformed, they will reject those teachings because of something that John Calvin consented to, or maybe the way that John Calvin spoke to his wife, or spoke about his wife, or some of the horrible things that John Calvin said or thought that they can point to, quotes from John Calvin, they will reject what Calvinists believe to be the actual teaching of Scripture because of, say, John Calvin's consenting to the burning of Servetus hmm. at the stake in the 1500s. That is a genetic fallacy. It's attacking the origin of a belief rather than the truthfulness of the belief itself. I personally am a Calvinist. I don't believe that Calvinism originates from John Calvin. I think it originates from Jesus and the Apostle Paul and Yahweh. Unbelievers will commonly apply this to people online and and, and in person when they're discussing the issue of the truthfulness of Christianity, they'll say, you're just a Christian because your parents were, or you're just a Christian because you were born in the West where Christianity is the predominant religion. Well, again, that's attacking the origin of the belief rather than the truthfulness of the belief itself. There's no question that historically Christianity has been dominant in the West, but the question is, is Christianity itself, biblical Christianity, actually true? Does it comport with reality? That's the issue at hand.
And what gets confused is the argument gets muddled by this, what I call noise, what I call intellectual noise, and people can't keep their stuff together. They can't keep their thoughts together and think clearly and cogently because they're attacking the origin of where people have gotten their beliefs from, say their parents or from their, their Western culture, whether the belief itself is true or not. Hmm. So I think it's important to, to point that out because the genetic fallacy is used a lot. It was Jason Lyle who said it would be like someone saying you only believe the uh, times table because you were taught it at school. <laughs> so. Right. The two key intellectual sins, and I use sins in quotes there, are arbitrariness and inconsistency. Okay. Arbitrariness and inconsistency are two key intellectual sins. Arbitrariness is when you believe something for no good reason whatsoever. And inconsistency occurs when you have blatant contradictions present in your worldview. How do those mistakes or sins, quote unquote, show up in people's worldviews? Well, here's an example. People have presuppositions that don't comport with each other. This is when somebody holds two mutually exclusive or contradictory beliefs in their worldview. This this would be an example would be um, an atheist believes in rights for all people and democratic fairness on the one hand, but yet believes in survival of the fittest on the other. Those two don't go together. Another example would be behavior that betrays professed belief. This would be an example of uh, teaching your students in college in your biology class that we're really just matter in motion, but yet you go home and the first thing you do when you enter the door is kiss your wife and children as if they had some type of inherent transcendent meaning and purpose. Hmm. Again, those, those two don't go together. Another example of that, like if you're dealing with a, a false religion, would be a Hindu believes that everything is Maya, everything is illusion, yet they hold tight to their wallet. Well, if everything's illusion, then the distinction between my money and your money is illusory, so give me, give it up. Give me your wallet. And I actually used that on campus one time when I was open air preaching. I had a guy come up and say he was a Hindu. I said, do you believe in Maya? He said, yeah. I said, you believe all is illusion? He said, yeah. I said, well, fork over your dough. And he did. He did. He took his wallet and, and laid it down right in front of me. After about 15 minutes, I said, hey, man, come get that wallet. He came over and he picked his wallet up. and Everybody knew the point had been made. But You should have asked him for his shirt. <laughs> yeah, right. Give me your see, shirt. See how far you could go. <laughs> Let me have your car keys. Keep going. <laughs> Another example, this happens a lot as well, especially when you're dealing with people who are really angry at God, is a prejudicial conjecture. This is when you're talking about something you're clueless about. An example would be when you're dealing with an unbeliever and they're just looking, they're just grasping at reasons to just reject the God of the Bible. They'll say things like, we can't trust the Bible because it's been translated over and over again. We don't know that what we have now is what they had then. They have a prejudice against the Bible based upon conjecture that has no basis in reality. Hmm. It's just they're believing it. It's another example of arbitrariness. They're believing it for no good reason. They've got an emotional, spiritual axe to grind against God for whatever reason, other than obviously the, the effects of sin on the mind. But there may be some personal hurt in their life, and they don't want to submit to the truths of Scripture because they know that if they do, they're accountable. So what they'll do is they'll just try to undermine or do a double egg takedown on the authority of the Word of God, and they'll say, well, you can't trust it because we don't know if anything that's in there is, is actually what was originally written down, etc. So... Those are some examples of how some of those things show up in people's worldview. So some of them, I don't know if you want to comment on them very briefly. I thought, uh, I think they come up quite a lot and they're, they're quite helpful to know about. So an appeal to emotion. Right, yeah, an appeal to emotion or an appeal to pity, something like that. Well, this mother is not going to be able, she's not going to be able to take care of the five children she already has, sir, if she has this child. Hmm. My wife is going to die the doctor has said that she can't, the last time we had a kid, she almost died. She almost didn't make it through the pregnancy. And I'm telling you, if she try, if she goes through with this pregnancy now, she's going to probably pass away. I cannot raise three kids living on just my income. So I, I hear these appeals to pity all the time. And I just say, mm -hmm. sir, I understand that. I've got four children myself. I understand how expensive they can be. These jokers can eat a lot of food, but that does not give us the authority, the right, or the intellectual justification to kill people. We don't get to kill people because later on their life might innocently put somebody else's life in danger any more than when a paramedic comes up on an accident scene and two people are dying. He doesn't cut through one and kill one to save the life of the other one that's on the bottom. Mm. You don't kill one person to save the other one. Yeah.
That's there, there's no moral justification for that. You do the best you can. And if both die, you did the best you can. If one dies, you did the best you can. If both survive, well, praise God. Yeah. Right. That's the biblical way to think through something like that. And I suppose the intention there is to try and distract you from the issue which is at hand. In a sense, it's irrelevant. It is. It's another example of the fallacy of relevant. It's another type yeah. of red herring. So a lot of this type of unclear thinking is very much intertwined. It's based mm. in arbitrariness and inconsistency. I think it's, it's interesting you said that these overlap because what I find is sometimes people say things which are so absurd. It's, it's, they seem to be committing several logical fallacies simultaneously. So I think it's it's good to study the approach and understand these things so that when you go into it, you're not trying to you know find the is exact logical fallacy. You're just you're trying to address the problems of their thinking. That's exactly right. You've already hinted at this, but when you're when you're speaking to people, you're speaking either to a believer or an unbeliever, you need to look at that situation and don't say, oh, you just committed a genetic fallacy. If you do that, somebody's going to smack you in the face. <laughs> don't do that. Just like you said, recognize that the stream of argumentation is very poor and try to focus on one or two things that they said that are inconsistent with what they previously said or what they believe elsewhere. At the end of the day, most people, they don't care about logic and reason. Yes, I agree. They don't care. All they want to do is they want to get done what they want to get done, and by golly, they're going to do it w whether they think God's against them or not because they have an agenda, and that agenda trumps all other agendas. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dustin, once again for, for joining us on this uh, Anvil and Hammer episode. I hope the listeners have learned lots and probably will go over this several times to get it all in. And I wish you a very good day. You too, brother. Thanks so much for having me. God bless you guys. Well, welcome back, everyone. So, Sarah, what do you make of that? You know, Christianity is true. It's reasonable. The Bible is true and reasonable. And, you know, I think it is very important to try and think rationally about the Bible, about witnessing to people. Dustin spoke about logic in a very humble way as well because I think there can be a danger you know the, the flesh can want to in a prideful way you know use logic to puff themselves up be puffed up and it's understanding the meaning of what the logical fallacy is and then I suppose interacting with the non-believer whoever you're talking to in a coherent way that is you know using simple language resisting that temptation to use this knowledge about logic to puff themselves up and show them show themselves to be really smart and intelligent you know i think it would probably take a lot of self-control and humbleness to use logic in a uh, in a in a humble way yeah knowledge puffs up doesn't it mm. and if we communicate the truth in a way that is unloving well, then we're no better than a, a clanging symbol so we do want to also reflect the nature and character of Jesus to the people we're talking to. And then prayer, understanding how prayer is important. Mm. And we must, after conversations, pray that if it is in accordance to God's will, that the Holy Spirit would regenerate, would open the eyes, spiritually speaking, of these people so mm. that they can profess, acknowledge the truth. I think Ray Comfort is a really good example of this he just comes to mind i've been watching some of living waters videos or short videos of ray witnessing to people and i think he's a great example of how to use logic in just a a natural sense when engaging with unbelievers because you watch his his videos you know he will very simply and point out flaws in the in the person's thinking and also hit the conscience i think he uses it in a very good way to share the gospel. Hit the conscience. That's becoming a catchphrase. You should get that on a shirt. I should, yeah. On a mug. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like Ray Comfort a lot. Recently been going through The Way of the Master, the season one, this kind of like old, naughty stuff. And it hasn't aged particularly well, but it's good stuff. It's its charm though as well, isn't and it? And he's talking charm. to this one guy on the street and this one guy's basically saying how he believes the earth is hell. And Ray's kind of speaking with him and he's saying, so you, you're having a good time here? He's like, yeah. So you, you're having a good time in hell? He's like, yeah. Then Ray says to him, are you making this all up? 
He goes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes that's how you sort of have to be with these conversations, being honest with people. Are you making this up? It really sounds like this is just, you know, you're making this up on the spot. Is that true? Mm-hmm. You, know, you might get some people who would admit that. Yeah, I am. I'm just making this up. And then just encouraging them to actually think about these things seriously, mm-hmm. to contemplate them and think about them rationally. Yeah. And, you know, I'm young enough in the faith to still remember that kind of thinking before you know, God caused me to be born again. I remember, you know, just the, the kind of fog over my my thinking and then willingly giving up reason in order to defend my sins. That's why I keep saying, you know, hit the conscience is because I think, um, you know, you can put up a facade, you can claim all these things to try and justify and excuse your sin. Yeah, so as I said before, try and adapt what you have learned into the army Bible board game through the questions that can be asked and then also teach this to those around you and use the Armory Bible board game as a way to do that. Okay, Sarah, I think it's hammer time. <laughs> I'm not going to sing the tuning out. I'm not you're sure if it's copyrighted you're singing, or not. You're singing it in your mind. I am. Go do it. <laughs> okay, we'll oh, do yeah, that. you almost did it there. I did. Careful, Sarah. Better be careful. I don't know. Better look that up. Right. The scripture we're reading today and we're going to think about is from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 29 to 31. This is what it says. Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his own son and all the way that you went until you came to this place. So that's a, a great scripture that shows God's faithfulness and provision through the wilderness and bringing the people of Israel into the land he had promised. And this expression, as a man carries his son, so I have brought you to this place. And it shows the the role of a father, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. How a father is to provide, to protect, and to instruct. You know, God takes them out, he gives them the law, he gives them his teaching. And that's the goal of a father, to do the same, to imitate God in his attributes and in his character in his home. Mm-hmm. And it's one thing that particularly heavy on my heart, which is to turn to what the scripture says about men and, and about fathers and husbands. It's such a pervading issue nowadays. We I suppose a hatred towards men. I think it's so important to uphold godly men as fathers and husbands. And even if they aren't godly, I suppose, obey the scriptures and and love and respect your husband and father. It's something I pray myself as well. It's something I pray in the church we'll see, just an appreciation of men. Yeah, misandry is a far greater problem in our culture than misogyny. And we'll definitely tackle that in the future Mm. sometime. Another thing that Sarah and I have done recently is we've done a live stream playing the Armory Bible board game. It's called Let's Play the Armory. And that's on the YouTube channel. It's on the Facebook page. And it's on the the website as well, thearmoryboardgame.com. I encourage you to look at that. That will teach you how to play. And one thing we also want to do, we want to make this a regular thing. So that's why it's important you follow us on social media because you'll know when we go live. You can interact with us. You can ask any questions you have about the game. The hope is that it'll be entertaining and you'll actually learn some Bible truth as well. Another important aspect about a live stream and why we wanted to do it is we were using the platform to also raise money for a Christian cause or a ministry for that particular live stream. We were raising money for North Korean Christians through Open Doors. It's a great platform to do that, I think. Yeah, so the idea is that you can send a message that will appear on screen if you donate any amount. I think it has to be above a pound or above a dollar just to stop sort of spam. But yes, your message will then pop on screen. The amount you donate will not be shown, neither will your name. So it's just a way that if you want to send a question, a message into us and also support the Christian ministry that we're raising funds for, it'd be a great way to do that. So please come out, come along and get involved in that. It can be a lot of fun when a lot of people get involved and interact. Now, when it comes to the Armory Bible board game, if you have any questions whatsoever, there's a contact on the website. I can answer any questions. I would even Skype you 
and even run through a game if that would help you. I am willing to do that. So please make contact if you want any help or assistance whatsoever learning how to play the game. And we, I could even be the game master of a particular game doing it through Skype for you. So that is something I can, I can do for you. So please contact if you have any questions whatsoever. And if you found this episode of The Anvil and Hammer helpful or encouraging, please share it because if it helped you, it's going to help somebody else. And that's what we want to do. We want to present a resource for the church so that they can go into the world and make disciples and train their children in the scriptures. Yes, and please comment because we know that a few people have listened, mostly uh, Sean's uh, my, mom. My mother. <laughs> Hi, Di. And now Sai's mom. <laughs> and now Sai's mom, yeah. Just leave feedback. It'd be nice for us to know, you know, what you're thinking about it and do you have any questions or do you agree with anything? Do you disagree with anything? Please just leave a short comment if you do listen. We'd appreciate that. Yeah, if you disagree with us, we will just block you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we won't listen to you, what you say if you disagree. I'm just... I'll take it very personally <laughs> and write something really angry and block you. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining in to this episode of The Anvil and Hammer. Have a good day. I'm out of here. Sean Bradford. Check out the armoryboardgame.com. Check out the blog there called The Anvil and Hammer for more blogs and podcasts. And... Definitely check out Bible in the Raw, Dustin Seegers, the Bible something we're not, dot com. Have a good day. God bless you. Bye. That's being in court. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're laughing now, but it's a possibility. <laughs> yeah, it's hammer time <laughs> I get the letter yeah I get the letter I'd be like oh it's hammer time now yeah <laughs> and then when the, the gavel's coming down yeah sent in to sing us I'd be like oh hammer time <laughs> <laughs>